Good morning. I bring you greetings here today on this Ascension Sunday from St. Mark United Methodist Church. But I'd love to say we're glad you're here. We're hopeful and glad that you're watching or listening with your family or sheltered in your own home. These days of quarantine continue. And so we do want to encourage you and bless you this day with a service of worship, which helped draw you closer to God. And even though we're not together, maybe close to one another because we're all sharing in the same worship service, listening to the same sermon, hearing the same scripture, and if we will, participating in the same prayers. This Sunday is also Memorial Day Sunday. Monday the 25th is Memorial Day. A day of vacation for many, but most importantly, a day of remembrance. In fact, this morning, I've invited Phil Lucas, a retired Marine, to share a word on behalf of Memorial Day Sunday and the veterans who served. Good morning, my name is Phil Lucas. Today is May 25th, 2020. This year represents the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Many iconic battles have happened in the history of the United States military armed forces. Over 1.28 million American citizens have given their lives in the defense of freedom around the world in such far-flung places as Bella Wood, the Argonne, Normandy, Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal. What all those men and women have in common is a love of country and a love of freedom and patriotism. Where do we find people like that? They come from all across this great nation, from the shopkeepers in the Northeast, to the lobster fishermen on the coast of Maine, to peach farmers in South Carolina, wheat farmers in Nebraska and cattlemen in Texas, lifeguards from California, lumberjacks from the Pacific Northwest. Each one left behind family and friends, loved ones, when the country called. To them we owe a debt we can never repay. We think of Memorial Day as not a celebration, but as a day of remembrance, where we remember the ones in our country who have paid the ultimate price for our freedom. To commemorate that, the ship's bell is often used to signal time in the naval service. It is used to signal the beginning and the ending of a watch, and even to tell time. So at this time, we will use the ship's bell to commemorate the sacrifice of those Americans. One tolling of the bell for each branch of the military. The United States Army. United States Navy. United States Air Force, United States Marine Corps, United States Coast Guard, In conclusion, I'd like to read the following poem which helps to symbolize what this day represents for all Americans. I watched the flag pass by one day, it fluttered in the breeze. A young Marine saluted it and then he stood at ease. I looked at him in uniform, so tall and straight and proud. He was the kind of individual who would stand out in any crowd. I thought of the many men like him who had fallen through the years. How many died in foreign soils, how many mothers tears. How many pilots planes shot down? How many died at sea? How many foxholes were soldiers' graves? No, freedom isn't free. I heard the sound of taps one night when everything was still. I listened to the bugler play and felt a sudden chill and wondered how many times that taps had meant amen when the flag had draped a coffin of a brother or a friend. I thought of all the, excuse me, 
I thought of all the families, the mothers and the wives, of fathers, sons, and husbands with interrupted lives. I thought about a graveyard at the bottom of the sea and unmarked graves in Arlington. No freedom isn't free. To all of you, I wish health, happiness, and a peaceful Memorial Day. Let us continue now with our worship as we have our silent prayers followed by the prayers of the people. And you at home, you can pray for whatever's on your mind, whatever discomfort you have, uh, whatever prayers you have for others in this moment as we open. Let us pray silently. And now we'll pray together. Gracious Lord, you have said that no one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. We remember the many brave men and women who have given their lives for our country. They offered their lives to protect our freedoms and the welfare of others. We thank you too for all those who have served in the military and made it home. As we thank you for these veterans that have returned, we also ask your blessings on all those who have sustained injury in mind and or body in the course of their service. Blessed are you, O God, for you have called us to care for one another and to be our brothers and sisters keeper and protector. As we remember this Memorial Day, May we do so with gratitude for so many. In the name of Him who is our Savior, even Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. We'll continue now with our scripture lesson from the New Testament. It's Ephesians 2, verses 6 through 10. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what He has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The Word of God for the people God. Thanks be to God. Now let us join together in the historic creed of our Christian faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And sit at the hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. <laughs> This is the time of the service where I invite the children to come and spend a few moments with me at the front of the church, realizing the children may be watching this service with you, and maybe they're not, but I'd still like to include this word this morning. You see in my hands a hat. This hat belongs to my father, who is thankfully still living. While he was serving in the United States Air Force, his father, my grandfather, was in the U.S. Navy. On this Memorial Day, we remember those who served in the military. Maybe your mother or father, maybe an aunt and an uncle, maybe a, a grandfather. Someone you know serves in the military or served in the military. And this is a day we want to remember and say thank you to them. Each time you see them, maybe you could give them a phone call. Maybe you, they're sitting near you. Maybe you could write them a note or send them a card to say thank you for what you did to, to serve this nation, to help keep us safe and free as Americans. And not only us as Americans, but many other countries as well during times of conflict or war. Most of us, of course, recognize the American flag. That is a symbol that we all live under as Americans. Again, the 13 stripes speak of the colonies that fought the Revolutionary War for our freedom. There's 50 stars on the blue field, representing one for each state in the United States of America. The flag is a symbol that flies over our government buildings, flies at Air Force bases or Army bases, on the ships at sea in the Navy, Marine Corps headquarters, found at public libraries. Maybe even some of you or someone you know has a flag in their yard. Again, the flag is there to remind us of who we are as a nation. And again, on this day, we give thanks for those who served in the armed forces. At this time, I invite you to spend some moments in prayer. I'll be praying for us, but during the course of the prayer, you'll have a chance to pray for someone yourself. There may be someone on your heart or mind this morning. Someone may be in the same room with you, or maybe across the miles. Maybe it's again a veteran, 
a family member who lost someone in the service, someone in need. One of the gifts we give each other, one of the ways we serve one another as followers of Jesus is to pray for one another. One of the ways we serve the world and those around us, believers or not, is by praying for them. And so during this time of prayer, I invite you to pray for those that are upon your heart. Let us join together for moments of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, a day to remember. Lord, as we come together in prayer, if not in person, we thank you, Lord, for those who served in the armed forces, particularly, Lord, those who, who lost their lives in the service of our nation, to fight for our freedom in times of conflict, pray to keep us safe in times of war. Lord, we know men and women have served in various capacities at various times. And Lord, we thank you for each family who they came from, especially those who missed their loved one because they did not come home. Lord, continue to hold those families together. And Lord, for those who are serving today, we ask your blessing upon them, whether stateside or overseas, Lord. May they know your presence with them. May you watch over them, Lord. May they know your presence near. Lord, thank you for those who are willing to serve in the armed forces. Lord, as long as we're remembering, we remember to those who are serving in the fight against the coronavirus. We think of the nurses, the pharmacists, the doctors, the lab technicians, the custodians, the orderlies, all those, Lord, who touch the life of someone through the food service through keeping the rooms clean. Lord, they put themselves at risk to help someone else. And so we ask your blessing upon them, Lord. And their families too, Lord, because we know some from time to time have had to be quarantined from their own family in order to keep them safe as they seek to serve people. People who are not of their family, but people they care about. Lord, that's the best example you give us for us as followers of you, is to care for others. So we pray for the caregivers this day and remember them in our prayer. Pray too, Lord, for firefighters, police officers, rescue workers. Bless and encourage them this day, Lord, for what they may face. And then we do pray for your church and all the many ways the churches are meeting during this time, whether sequestered, in isolation, Lord, there are those who meet in countries where they're under constant persecution, who meet in private out of fear of being found out. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world and pray that sometime soon each of us may come together into our churches, the places where we gather to worship, and that we might lift our voice in song, we might lift our voice in in words of welcome and encouragement, might bow our heads in prayer one with another. So, Lord, continue to bless and sustain your church in all the many places it is around the world and even scattered throughout our community here in Greenwood. May we be faithful to our calling. Lord, as we gather together in prayer, I know there are people who are hurting this morning. They might be facing physical pain or discomfort or maybe a broken heart a broken dream. Lord, some are finding great financial pressures. Lord, bless and encourage them this day. May you be the God of hope and a rock for them to stand on. There are those, Lord, who are anxious and afraid. Be the God of peace to speak a word of comfort to their hearts, encouragement to their souls. Lord, there are those who, like we do from time to time, we fall short. We've said things we wish we hadn't said to those closest to us. We've done things we shouldn't have done. We've hurt someone else. We've hurt others. We've hurt ourselves. So, Lord, we ask for your mercy, your forgiveness. And thank you because of Christ, we know that forgiveness is ours. Lord, as we pray this morning, there are others upon our hearts and minds that we want to lift up to you by name in prayer.
Gracious Lord, you hear our hearts as you hear our voices. Bless those that we pray for. May they know your presence near. May you grace them according to their need. Thank you, Lord, that we can talk to you. We can tell you what's in our hearts and minds. We can converse with you in prayer, knowing that you hear us, that you respond, that we're not alone because you are with us. So Lord, help but teach us how to pray in times of isolation, in times of uncertainty. Lord, teach us how to pray. We might keep our lines of communication open. We might better hear what you'd say to us. We better follow your will. For we long to be faithful followers of your son, Jesus. And so we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Praying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our second reading this morning comes from the book of 2 Timothy, the first chapter. I'll be reading verses 9 and 10. The God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death, brought life and immortality through the light of the gospel. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For Lord, you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen.
On this date, May 24th, in 1738, a 35-year-old Anglican priest was making his way to a Bible study, what was called a society meeting of Moravians, a group of Christians from Austria, Germany. He went there with a heavy heart, so many things upon his mind, doubting his calling as a priest, wondering if God was pleased with him or God was angry at him. So aware of his failures and his flaws, of who he was and who he was not. But something happened at that meeting that, that would change his life. In fact, would change England. It even changed a good deal of the world. Let me read you from his own words from his diary. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Martin Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About before nine, while he was describing the change that God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. An assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Felt his heart strangely warm. Felt he did trust in Christ, Christ alone, for his salvation. Did not in his works, the things he'd done, not in the law that God had given, which he couldn't keep, but the grace of God. That is the story of John Wesley. John Wesley, who start would become the Methodist Church. A great story of a conversion, of a new beginning, a new life, a transformation, all that came because of God's grace. And that word grace, I think, captivated Wesley in so many ways. And I feel as United Methodists, it's the, the best word we have to share, to live in, to be a part of, God's grace. In 1738, May 24th, Wesley had his heartwarming experience, his encounter with the grace of God that changed him. And over time, he'd realized that it didn't start that night in 1738, but started much earlier. He was born in 1703, but when he was five years old, 1709, there was a fire, at the house where he lived a fire that he was rescued from by his mother and carried out, saved from the burning was the way he described it. His life almost over before it began. But God had a calling. God had plans. God gave grace to a little boy who didn't even know what lay before him. In 1728, he was ordained an Anglican priest. Again, not because... He was so sure of a calling from God, but because he thought maybe he could earn God's approval in the priesthood. In 1729, he started what he called the Holy Club with his brother and a few other men, dedicated to the task of, of trying to work out this salvation thing, to, to earn God's approval through their life of piety and holiness. They were first called Methodists at that time because they had a method. They had ways of doing things, trying to achieve a holiness, to bring a changed life about by their efforts and activities, long hours of prayer, lots of fasting, hours of Bible reading. It wasn't what they were doing was so bad, but it was for the wrong reason. It wasn't they were reading the scripture to draw closer to God, but trying to earn God's approval through what they read. It wasn't because they prayed, they, they opened their hearts up to God, but thought maybe God would look down upon them with favor because they were praying. He even became a missionary, going to Savannah in 1735, Savannah, Georgia, part of James Oglethorpe's Oglethorpe plan, where he built a town, a colony, and put a church in the middle of it. It was a disaster. But along the way, again, one of God's bits of grace was he met the Moravians. The Moravians were strong in their faith, had a joyous spirit, and even during a storm, when the ship was tossed about and, and people were crying out, save us, save us, they sang hymns. They had a confidence in God. No matter what happened, they would be okay. Wesley would learn to describe these activities of God as prevenient grace. 
Pre means before. Vini means to come. Provenient grace is the grace that comes before. He wasn't, he believed, saved during that time, but God was working on his life. God was moving and doing things even before he knew it. It'd be like Paul saying in Romans that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Before we even knew our salvation, Christ died for us. In fact, if you read in 1 Peter, it says that Christ was slain before the foundation of the world. God's grace was evident that should humanity fall or fail, should they rebel and sin, that God had from the foundation that Christ would come and would die for our freedom, for our forgiveness. That's prevenient grace. I see it in the situation of times in our lives where things happen, and we sometimes call it a coincidence or luck, but it could be God's grace going before us. Early in my ministry, when I first went to the first church I served as associate pastor, the senior minister had been without an associate pastor. His had, had to be appointed somewhere else. And so he was out someone to help him, had the church to himself, a large church. And I was there maybe two weeks. He was diagnosed with a heart condition, a severe heart condition that would end up him having to have a heart transplant. He'd be gone for four months. But because of God's timing, he got an associate there before it was diagnosed. Before he had the surgery, I was in place for about a month and knew part of what was necessary. He went to MUSC to have the heart transplant. And his brother had a house there that he rented. His brother had lived there several years. And so when he came out of the hospital after the heart transplant, he could stay in Charleston with his brother near the hospital to get the test done and the feedback that, that was so important during those early days of recovery. He was finally released to come home in January. At the end of that very month, his brother had to give up the house. The lady wanted to sell it. No longer was a home available, but the home was there when he needed it. God's prevenient grace that, that's at work in our lives, doing things even before we realize we need it. Even before we reach that intersection, God's present, God's active, God's doing things. Less understood that prevenient grace was so important, even in his own life. Before that day of May 24, 1738, he could point to signposts of God working, God doing things, preparing him for that moment. So when he heard the, the preface to a commentary, can you believe that? The preface to Luther's commentary on the book of Romans. Something changed his heart. The grace of God. The passage Brian read this morning from Ephesians talks about the saving grace of God. It says, by grace you have been saved. And for our grace you've been saved through faith. And it's not by the things we've done. It's by God's grace that we're saved. There's the, the saving grace that comes. It's the gift of Christ on the cross. And whosoever believes in him will not perish, but be given everlasting life. Salvation is an act of grace, a gift of grace that comes to us because of Christ. Further, in the passage I read this morning, the grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. That's again that idea of the prevenient grace. When the world started, God's grace was there in Christ. It's like God the Father had plans that God the Son carried out to give us the grace for salvation. And then further it says in Titus chapter 3, the Spirit is poured out on us through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so we might be justified by grace and become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That the Spirit too, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all involved in, in the grace of God that comes to us. He talks about justifying grace, the grace of God that says, just as if I'd never sinned. That's the forgiveness. Saved by God's grace for a new life in Christ, justified by God's grace to be forgiven for all our sins. Again, that wonderful phrase, just as if I'd never sinned, that God sees you clean and righteous. Again, not because of what you've done, <laughs> no, no, but because of what Christ has done. And that grace is made available through the Christ, life of Christ and his gift to us, if we receive the gift he gives us. Of course, the grace of God is what keeps us. It's the change agent in our lives. Peter says in chapter 4, Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you have received. 
Whoever speaks must do so speaking the very words of God. Who serves must do so with the strength that God supplies. So God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. So he gives us grace to be manifest through our life. It, it might come in some things we say, the word of encouragement, a word of blessing, a prayer for someone else. Those are, are ways we speak with God's grace, and others are, are blessed by that. Others receive something from God because of what we say. It says through service, through the strength God provides, God gives us the strength, the insight to do what we can to help someone else. Or it's an act of kindness of holding the door open or picking up something they dropped, letting them go first in line at the grocery store, praying for them, picking up some extra groceries, baking cookies, giving them away. See, God gives grace that is demonstrated through our lives, through what we say, Peter says, and through things we do. And all of it, God gets glorified. One other important passage of grace, let me read to you, is from the book of Hebrews. It says, Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. We might receive mercy and grace in times of need. God's grace is always available to us. We can boldly approach His throne of grace, that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a source of all grace. We might receive mercy because sometimes we've fallen short. We've blown it again. We, we shouldn't have said anything, and, and we said something. We knew we should have kept it out of it, and we, we got involved. We did something we shouldn't have done. Someone's hurt. Someone's now disappointed. Someone's angry. Maybe it's ourselves. But we go to that throne of grace to receive mercy because God's grace comes as mercy and forgiveness. And also grace to help in time of need because sometimes we're anxious and afraid. And the grace we need is, a, is peace. Sometimes we're down and discouraged and, and the grace we need from God is, is hope. Sometimes we're so down, and God wants to give us the grace through joy. All these are gifts of God's grace. It's another way of saying God's love. The grace is the stuff of God that, that comes when we need it in the ways we need it. Coming before us proveniently, coming at salvation to change our life, coming to justify us that we know we're forgiven for all we've done or haven't done. We can boldly come before that throne of grace anytime, any place receive the mercy and grace we need each and every day. So what's your need today? What's your situation? I hope you know the God of grace. Know him already, a follower of Jesus, and, and receive the gifts he gives us. But maybe you have been like Wesley, trying to prove yourself, earn God's approval, trying to, to make it happen yourself, to become different by your own efforts and strength. Wesley tried that for many years. All left him was frustrated and anxious, often very afraid. But then that day, May 24th, 1738, hearing the preface of a commentary that was 200 some years old from Luther, God spoke to his heart. And he received God's grace in a way he had never had before, that suddenly he was able to, to receive what God was working on all those years before. And it changed his heart. When Wesley's heart got changed, it, it began to change his life. It began to change the lives of others and change the, the city of, of London. It began to change England. And when people came from overseas, from England to America, why Methodists came there as well. And they've been changing people's lives ever since. Churches like this church and others that are United Methodists, followers of Wesley, because we're receiving God's grace. I hope this morning you'll go before the throne of grace for what you need. I hope this day you'll know the God who is with you and abounds with grace to give you. You may never need walk alone, never need walk in fear, never need be discouraged or overwhelmed. You'll have those times, but that's when you come to God to receive and ask for the grace you need, knowing that he hears and that he loves you. And he's at work in your life, doing things you don't know yet. That provenient grace that goes before. Your, your story is not over. The, the last thing's not been said. Who knows what God has yet in store for you? Because of his love. Because of his great grace. It's available for you today and tomorrow 
and always. Amen. We receive the blessing. I close with words from 2 Peter. Now may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he might be glorified in your life because you receive the gifts he gives, that you know the hope that he gives you, the peace that is yours, the joy to live in and love always, to be glory through his church, scattered in different places, but always loved and graced by God. And may he use you through your words that he gives and, and the grace, the strength to serve others that he might be glorified in your life and through your life. This day and always, now and forever. Amen.